our city from before the pandemic will still be here for us on the other side. And with that, Jennifer Berkshire is a freelance journalist and co-host of the education podcast, Have You Heard? She spent six years editing a newspaper for the American Federation of Teachers in Massachusetts, and her writing on the politics of education has appeared in The Nation, Salon, The Baffler, The Progressive, and The New Republic. Jack Schneider is an award-winning education historian and the author of three books. His last, Beyond Test Scores, A Better Way to Measure School Quality, was released in 2017. He co-founded the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment, a partnership of eight Massachusetts public school districts and their local teacher unions. And he's an assistant professor of leadership and education at UMass Lowell and Jennifer's co-host on the podcast, Have You Heard? Diane Ravish is a research professor of education at New York University and historian of education. She served as assistant secretary of education during the administration of Bush Pear and is the founder and president of the Network for Public Education. She's the author of 13 books, editor of 14 others, and has written over 500 articles and reviews for scholarly and public, popular publications. And she recently reviewed Berkshire and Schneider's new book for the New Republic. That book's entitled A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School. And it's the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Diane Rabich in conversation with Jack Schneider and Jennifer Berkshire. Thank you so much. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you in Seattle once again. Uh, this is my third trip to Seattle, but my first virtual trip. So uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to talk with Jack and Jennifer, both of whom are wonderful writers and thinkers and uh, great allies in terms of our fight to save public education from privatization and ultimately uh, the subject of their book, which is uh, a movement to really undermine and replace and displace public education. Uh, so let me first of all begin by asking uh, Jack and Jennifer some questions about their book. Uh, you wrote your book during the last year of the Trump administration uh, when Betsy DeVos was the secretary and she was certainly uh, the greatest enemy of public education that has ever held the role of secretary of education. Uh, she was, in many ways, the personification of the, of the wolf that you write about. Who is the wolf now? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Diane, and, and I'm so glad that it's coming from you uh, because, you know, in many ways, you're the person who kind of showed us the way uh, and began to make an argument that something scary was happening in public education. Uh, and for the last 10 years, you've been the leading chronicler of that. Uh, so um, I know that you also are not relieved, even though Betsy DeVos is gone. Uh, you're right that you know she was the greatest enemy of public education to hold that role. Um, but you know, the, the threat to public education is really not one that uh, is a federal threat. It's really one that's playing out at the state level. Uh, so, you know, when Jennifer and I first started writing this book, I, th I think we both thought that it was a book about Betsy DeVos. We were both outraged by her. Um, you know, we wanted to make some kind of difference in uh, the election that we saw uh, coming from, you know, a few years out, uh, as they tend to do. Um, and we wanted to, you know, try to write about DeVos in a way that made sense uh, for, you know, both blue and red state voters uh, and for Democrats and Republicans and independents that made sense for them um, what the real threat posed by Betsy DeVos was. And as we started working on the book, what we realized is that DeVos was really the tip of the iceberg. And I think that's the perfect metaphor here because um, she was this highly visible and yet less ultimately dangerous um, threat where, you know, the, the deeper threat lies beneath the surface. I'm thinking of a line from your book, Reign of Error, Diane, in which you instructed readers to, I think it was recognize that public education is a public responsibility, not a consumer good. And if you invert that, you've got your threat, you've got your wolf. Um, and that is an aim, right, to, to invert that, to turn public education into a consumer good, that's playing out at the state level uh, in all sorts of states, red and blue right now, just to the north of us. Jennifer and I both live in Massachusetts, um, just to the north of us in New Hampshire. Um, there's a voucher bill that uh, would essentially devastate 
uh, public education for the foreseeable future by channeling the state per pupil expenditure into a voucher that could be spent anywhere, uh, it, not at a public school, but at a private school and any kind of private school. Um, so uh, ultimately, I think that um, we came away from this believing that um, you know, we're relieved that DeVos is gone, but we're actually more scared about what's happening elsewhere. And I, I would just add to that, that, you know, we're so focused on what's happening at the federal level, you know, with, with Biden and, you know, the various, the confirmations and talking about, you know, what is, what is his sec proposed secretary of education Cardona going to be like, but the real action is at the state level and something like 23 states have proposed expansion of school choice bills and, and not sort of the kind of deliberate, slow, steady expansion we've seen in the past, but some of these bills are sweeping measures. And I'm thinking of New Hampshire, as Jack mentioned, but also a state like West Virginia, where essentially what's happened is that Republicans made big gains in the legislature there in 2020. You know, they hold all the branches of power and they're, they're essentially saying, you know what, we're not gonna do public education anymore. We're gonna give the money directly to the parents and let the parents decide what they wanna do, uh, do with it. We're gonna take the money we're currently spending and we're gonna use that to subsidize families that already send their kids to private schools or homeschool their kids. And I think people are finally sort of waking up to what a drastic vision this is. And then the other thing that I I'm constantly trying to remind people as we talk about this book is that even though ostensibly it's a book about education, it really is a book about democracy, right? The reason that the right is so obsessed with education policy at the state level is because it's the single biggest ticket item in every state. And so if your goal is to dramatically reduce the tax burden on the wealthiest among us, that's the thing that you have to go after. If your goal is to kneecap the largest and strongest organized voice for a social safety net, that's your teacher's union, right? That's why West Virginia, the legislature just made uh, not just striking illegal, but any kind of protest by public employees, including teachers, right? Um, uh, whether we're talking about elected school boards or you know the ability of people to band together to make demands about the kind of schools that they want and the level of services they want their government to provide. These are all the things that are in the crosshairs. So while it seems like it's about a book about education, it's actually something much bigger. I, I'm curious to ask you, it's a question that I've wondered about a lot and that is uh, we three and lots of people that we talk to are aware of what's going on. We know that there are uh, almost half the legislatures in the country making these radical changes that would change the bargain, which is that there are public services that the public pays for, even if you don't have children, even if you don't have children in school, even if your children go to private school, even if your children have graduated from school, you pay for public education because it's an investment in society. Uh, you want everyone to be educated. And yet we see this privatization moving, movement, particularly in the red states. I, not, I don't think, I think that, that, and you show this in your book, Democrats have begun to see the light. I won't say they do entirely. But the question I have for you is, why is the media, especially the national media, so completely indifferent to this looming threat to the wolf at the schoolhouse door? Why is the media silent? I don't, I never see a program on CNN, MSBC, any of the major networks, nobody's talking about this. I, I'll jump in on that one. Um, you know, I think that one of the reasons is that our public education system can be a little difficult to make sense of because the power lies in so many different places. Um, first of all, it's fractured across 100,000 schools. Um, there are 13,000 school districts. Um, I don't know what's going on in most other states unless I'm writing a book about it. Uh, and so because of this, it can actually be hard to figure out what's the bigger picture here, right? We see the one little tile, what's happening in our community um, or what's happening in our school or 
possibly even as granular as what's my kid's experience, but it can be difficult to step back and see, you know, what is the bigger picture? And as a result, I think that we're just not used to having a conversation that is anything other than extremely granular or incredibly abstract. And the abstract conversation that we've been having for the last 30 years is that America's schools are failing, right? And that, that's a dangerous conversation, not only because it's not rooted in reality, but also because it opens the door to highly interventionist reform. And I think, I think our media are just used to telling those two kinds of stories, right? Here's a story about this one school or this one district, or here's a story about the nation's schools. And in this case, you really need to stitch together what's going on in a number of different states and see that there's actually a coherent ideology behind the effort to unmake public education. And I think this is the other part of why we haven't seen this story is that it can be difficult to piece together these different tiles in the mosaic because on the one hand, you know, what does an attack on a teacher's union have to do with support for virtual schools? And what do either of those have to do with a support for a voucher program? And I think what Jennifer and I realized as we wrote the book is that if you understand the ideology that underpins these policy efforts, and you know, we describe it as four tenets of faith, right? That there's a belief in private aims over public ones. Um, there's deep faith in markets and skepticism of public governance. Uh, there's a, a powerful desire to cut costs. Jennifer mentioned that uh, public education expenditures total about half a trillion dollars annually if you add them all up. And there's uh, you know, real hatred uh, for organized labor. If you understand that that's a coherent ideology, and then you see that these policy efforts drive forward that ideology, and then you see that they're playing out in all of these different states, all of a sudden, I think there's a picture and uh, it, it's one that has been covered by some journalists. I think of the journalists in Arizona, for instance, as being really essential in that regard. Um, but you know, our, our hope is that this is a story that gets picked up more and more. And I'm sure Jennifer, as a journalist, has something to add to that. Well, I've been sort of driven insane by this. I feel like, you know, I, I often comment about this on Twitter and then I walk around my house sort of muttering about some, you know, something I've just read about that's happening in Tennessee or Arizona. And my husband's sort of like, I don't, what, I, what do I want to know about education in Arizona? But I think another part of the problem is that the media core operates very firmly from within the vantage point of a blue state bubble. And so they see the school privatization debate as one being about expanding high performing urban charter schools. And you know, there's a coalition of big city mayors and, and democratic legislators, and you've got all these education reform groups. Maybe you have some moderate Republicans in there too, but that's really how they see it. And so when you hear a call, for example, to, you know, it's time to stop fighting about charter schools, there's no regard for how school choice is being used as a political weapon in this vast swath of the country, right? So in Missouri this week, legislators were up all night because Republicans are pushing a very aggressive bill to move charter schools into rural areas. And that's just not reflected in the media conversation at all. And I think it just, it falls right into that larger problem we have where the coastal elites are kind of oblivious to the whole midsection of the country. I, um, I'm from the heartland. I know neither of you is, so I feel looked down on by both of you. I'll, I'll pause there. Uh, 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 wait a minute, I'm from Texas. <laughs> I went to public schools in Houston. That's right, I take it back. Just Jack then, he's the snob. <laughs> both coasts. <laughs> uh, but you're, you're, I think you're right that uh, between the coast, uh, there is an aggressive, movement and it's a national movement. And it's something that I've been saying again and again. And sometimes I feel I'm preaching to the choir because everybody I talk to knows this, they see it, they know it's very well funded. And um, I think it might be helpful if you talked about the political forces uh, behind the privatization movement and also the, the money. I mean, Seattle is in Washington state and one of the biggest funders of privatization uh, several of them, in fact, live in Washington state. Uh, Bill Gates uh, is the one I'm thinking of, 
uh, but he has uh, allies in, in the tech industry who have seen privatization as the free market and education. What can be wrong with that? Jennifer, you want me to, why don't you kick, uh, kick, yeah, kick I off will. our response? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, since I'm in the presence of two education historians, I'm going to go way back in the time machine. And so Jack and I do this podcast together. And my favorite part is that I, pre-pandemic, I would spend a lot of time on the road. I would go to places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Texas. And especially when I was in the industrial Midwest, what I noticed was that so much of what was happening there politically, uh, and especially this, you know, centered on the dismantling of public schools, was this kind of angry politics left over essentially from the New Deal, right? That these industrialists had never gotten over feeling like the government had tilted the playing field against them and in favor of these horrible unions. And so decade after decade after de decade, they had very systematically worked to get control of their, every lever of their state politics and you know, pretty systematically uh, weaken the teachers unions and really all the different structures of democratic oversight involved in, in public education. And then I think that, that what, what happened along the way that really complicated things, and Jack, I'm gonna let Jack talk more about the players, but what happens is you have this pretty extreme movement that dates back, uh, you know, uh, way back, and then you know is reinvigorated during the Reagan years, and then it really post Clinton, Democrats start to sound a lot like them. They start to talk about you know things like government schools and the public school monopoly. And over the years, we lose the ability to hear what an extreme vision this really is. And as you have money pouring in from Silicon Valley, from this kind of, you know, like venture tech people who you were describing, Diane, it starts to seem like this actually quite extreme vision is, you know, is mainstream and has the gloss of respectability. So we fast forward to today and a DeVos emerges on the scene. And, you know, I knew who she was because I'm from the Midwest. And I was shocked that you know she represents a very extreme point of view and yet over you know over the last decade we've heard more and more sort of centrist politicians democrats especially democrats and their reform organizations sounding more and more like her and jack maybe you can uh, do the grunt work of laying out sort of who some <laughs> of these groups are yeah thanks for leaving that to me to try to make sure i don't call a foundation a center or an institute either of the other options uh yeah i mean for me if i go back in time i'm thinking about the 1960s uh and the kind of institution building that happened in the wake of Barry Goldwater's defeat, uh, that there was a new kind of conservatism that was energized by Barry Goldwater's run for president. And you know his trouncing in the polls there did not lead to the end of that movement. It was really the birth of the movement because many of those who became leaders uh, in this sort of splinter of the conservative movement that now really is, um, you know, the mainstream of the Republican Party in terms of its leadership um, and has absolutely colonized the Republican Party in terms of their education policy, they began building institutions. It was actually a very smart move. And so we see the rise of the Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, um, the Cato uh, Institute, um, these are, you know, national level think tanks and policy shops. Um, the Hoover, uh, God, is Hoover a foundation or an institute? Um, institute. Institute, yeah, institution, that's right. It's not an institute, it's an institution. Um, Hoover really sort of pivots um, around this time away from its uh, kind of, you know, Red Scare, Cold War focus, John Birch Society um, type activity into more of the radical free market oriented work that, you know, so many people think of them doing now. There's also the rise of these state level policy shops and think tanks, right? Places like um, the Heartland Institute, or in, in Michigan, um, Mackinac, in um, Arizona, it's the Goldwater Institute. And then there are these other kinds of organizations, like the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is Koch-funded, not 
the soft drink, but uh, the oil billionaire Cokes uh, and um, the American Legislative Exchange Council. One of the things that they do is in addition to um, seeding these ideas with lawmakers, they hand them model legislation that is ready to go. Just fill in the name of your state here. And so there's actually um, a, a very powerful infrastructure there to drive forward ideas that are actually out of line with what mainstream Republican voters want. If you go and you talk to ordinary Republican voters, they are no different than ordinary Democratic voters in that they like their public schools, right? Uh, polling year after year reveals that despite the national narrative that we have about failing schools, that most Americans feel pretty positively about their own kids' schools. Now, do we have gross inequities in our country that we need to address? Absolutely, immediately, right? Segregation continues to be a scourge. We have yet to fully fund our schools. But the fact is, is that most kids go to a good public school and their families feel good about that. And yet there is this policy apparatus in place to drive forward really far right ideas that as Jennifer said, the Democrats have unwittingly really sort of legitimized um, the metaphor I've been using lately is that, you know, centrist Democrats worked with mainstream Republicans over the past couple decades to lay a runway down. And now they're surprised that the far right is landing policy airplanes. It's really naive that they didn't see this coming. Well, you know, I, I often think that uh, Alec, uh, as you put it, the American Legislative Exchange Council is, is like the, the, the nerve center of this right wing privatization movement. And it's been puzzling to me that, uh, as you put it, average Republicans don't share this animus towards public education. If you think about it, most states have 85 to 90 percent of their children attending public schools. That means that it's not just the children of Democrats, it's children of Republicans as well. Even where there's choice, they're not choosing to send their kids to charter schools. Uh, they're not sending their kids to religious or, or, or voucher schools. They're choosing their local public school. And yet the, the main stream of the Republican party has become antagonistic to public education, which is a bit of a paradox. Um, and I've always thought that when, when I was speaking to uh, conservative groups or conservative foundations, I would say to them, you know, conservatives are supposed to conserve, right? I mean, you don't come into a community and say, let's blow up the public schools and city hall and start from scratch. And yet, uh, having worked myself in some of these right-wing think tanks, uh, I would hear these kinds of radical statements of let's blow it all up. And that's not conservative, that's anarchist. It's radical. Uh, and so there, there is a disconnect. But I think that what's made this uh, movement uh, even more powerful than it should be is the fact that, as you put it, so many Democrats have bought in partially. And they don't understand that when you accept the idea of school choice, uh, you're paving the way from charters to vouchers. And they want to say, no, charters only, not vouchers. Like the Center for American Policy is a major democratic think tank. They favor charters, but they don't favor vouchers. And they don't understand that they're actually in league with uh, the people who want vouchers and with DeVos and with the Koch. I used to say the Koch brothers, but it's just the Koch. Only one. <laughs> only, only Charles Koch. Um, and it's it's been a puzzlement to me that we can't get that point across, that um, there is something about democracy, and you put it well, Jennifer, uh, that means that uh, we, we don't have the government pay so that everyone can have their own swimming pool. Uh, we don't pay for everyone to have their own highway. I mean, there are some obligations that the government owes to society in order pro to promote the general welfare. Uh, and yet in education, uh, we're really not back on our heels right now uh, fighting off these wolves uh, that are now rapaciously attacking the public schools in state after state. Uh, and uh, because of the Republican gains in the last, in the 2020 election, the gains in the state houses, uh, it's gotten to be difficult because there are super majorities in so many states, uh, Republican super majorities. And I guess the question I've wondered about and continue to wonder about is, why do Republicans hate public schools when their own children go there? <laughs> and maybe you answered that, but it's, it's still one that, that I'm hung up on. 
I, I've thought about that a lot because, you know, in my travels, I would make a point of going to these rural communities that were some of the, you know, reddest counties in Wisconsin and Michigan. And, you know, only to find out that at the, you know, the same time that they were going to the polls and voting for Trump in the, you know, by larger percentages than anywhere else in Wisconsin, they were voting to raise their own taxes to, to invest in their schools. And, and, you know, invest in facilities expansions and, and a maker space and a new art center. And, and this has really been the case, you know, you can, you can find this happening all over the country, right? And it's important to acknowledge that the intense polarization that's sort of tearing us apart on just about every issue, the schools are not exempt from that, right? That the, you're starting to hear people talk about K-12 in the same way that they've, they've started talking about higher ed. Um, which is, you know, the rub on higher ed state, uh, in, in a lot of states is that it's where kids go to be indoctrinated. And so you are hearing, you're hearing uh, lawmakers start to talk about K-12 in the same way, um, especially in, in states like Arizona, where this has, been a, this has been a big deal. But the question that I have, Diane, is that these are really extreme policies we're, we're talking about. Moving away from a system of taxpayer funded education to one where you give money directly to parents and let parents customize their children's education. You argue that parents understand their children best and so they're the ones who should determine whether the child should go to a school or maybe purchase, you know, curriculum for homeschooling or, you know, some other, uh, a weird hybrid alternative, like a for-profit micro school that's now they're popping up around the country. But if I were a business leader, I would view this development with extreme concern. I heard an interview recently that uh, the Center for Education Reform head, Jeannie Allen, did with Reed Hastings, um, who's the CEO of Netflix. Hastings is very enamored of charter schools and scaling up charter schools in urban areas. And she asked him, what did he think of this idea of just giving some money directly to the parents and letting them direct their kids' education? He was horrified, right? Like how, you know, how do you, how do you develop uh, like an industrial policy when we've decided, you know what, we're not gonna do public education anymore. We're gonna do this kind of ad hoc approach. I think that, you know, that actually is the one piece that might take care of itself because um, Americans are so used to this idea that the only way to get ahead is through education and specifically by getting the right credential um, that if we are going to see a race to the bottom, the bottom will be some sort of basic job readiness, but the market failure there, and you know anybody who has actually studied economics rather than pretending to have studied economics um, can tell you that the market is not perfect, that the market fails, and the market will fail to prepare young people for the task of citizenship, right? Because that's not what the market will reward. And there are things like that that I am deeply concerned about. My daughter goes to a racially and economically integrated school. Um, that's good for America and it's good for her, right? I don't see the market as a mechanism that is going to do that for all of our kids. And in as much as choice is an element in our existing school system, uh, we have seen that it has actually exacerbated problems like racial and economic segregation. And so for me, I'm less worried about this piece of, you know, what's going to happen to the economy or, you know, the, the uh, productivity of the labor force. And I'm more concerned about um, what are the areas that will just simply fall through the cracks in terms of uh, what public schools do. And in fact, as our friend Derek Black argues in his new book, Schoolhouse Burning, um, what the schools in fact were created to do, or at least you know, the funding behind public education was designed to do, uh, which was to not leave these things to chance. Well, you know, the thing, uh, you know, so many things puzzle me despite the fact that I've been deeply immersed in this for a long time, like 11 years and uh, 12 years or so. Um, we now have a lot of experience. Uh, these are not innovative ideas anymore. And so when people say they want innovation, charters are not innovative. We've had charters now for 30 years. Uh, we've had vouchers for 30 years. We know what the results are. We know that uh, after 30 years of 
hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of dollars being poured into the charter sector. Um, maybe one out of five charters gets higher test scores, maybe. Uh, many of them are the worst performing schools in their state. Uh, there are many, many examples, and you cite them in your book, uh, of corruption, embezzlement, graft, et cetera, because of the absence of oversight in most states where charters are uh, not held accountable and are not transparent. So we know that the free market is not going to create equity. The one thing the free market never creates is equity. That's, That's I, right. I think I can say that is a, a certainty. The free market creates winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And we can look at our own economy and say, the free market has created some fabulous winners like Reed Hastings and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, but we have an awful lot of losers and that's the nature of the free market. And some people say, tough, that's life. Uh, and others say, no, it's up to society to try to counter the excesses of the free market. Do we really want to in, uh, transfer that philosophy to education? Um, and when people say, well, you know, as someone did recently in a New York Times piece, we should just like all good schools, whether they're charter or public, it really doesn't make a difference. But it does make a difference because when you have a pie, which very few people are willing to expand and you divide it into two pieces, you're not gonna create better education for everyone. Uh, you're going to create worse education where the public schools can no longer afford the arts, they can no longer afford a library, a, a social worker, a psychologist, a reducing class class, all these things that are necessary for good schools. So I think that the free market philosophy itself, uh, this is not a new idea. We've, you know, as an economy, we've lived with this for generations. And in terms of schools, we know the data on charters. Uh, they don't, they're not better than public schools. Most of them are not. And in terms of vouchers, they're worse than public schools. And uh, I think about places like Florida where, and I'm sure it's true of other states as well, there is no accountability uh, for voucher students. They are not subject to the same test. Uh, they're not tested at all. They use whatever curriculum they want and they use curricula that, uh, that is basically um, whatever fits their religious ideology. Uh, so I guess the thing that worries me most, and I'm curious to hear you play this out is, if we go in the direction where uh, states like West Virginia, New Hampshire, Arizona, and others, I mean, there are now you know, a couple of dozen states that want to do this, say, give the money to the parents, let them do whatever they want to do, homeschool. We're going to be degrading the education of our society. Instead of improving our public schools, we're going to simply uh, defund them and let people do their own thing. And I, I'm very fearful of what that means for the future. I think to me, one of the really weird things about our present moment is that we really have reached this sense of collective exhaustion with the sense that the free market can solve everything, right? Like people get that that's a big part of why our pandemic response was such a disaster that, you know, it's so much harder for us to do things like organize vaccine distribution than it is in other countries. We look at what happened in Texas with the complete collapse of their energy grid. And, you know, and people say, that's crazy. It's crazy that a public good like energy would be treated in this way. And that, you know, people are getting $15,000 bills on their credit cards while, you know, uh, energy company moguls are cheering, right? That's a, that's a crazy way to run a country. And you're hearing statements like that from both sides of the political spectrum. Somebody like a Josh Hawley railing against Walmart for you know, its role in devastating the, the heartland and rural communities. And so I feel like this is a big step forward, right? That we've been in the clutches of this real like intense ideological fever for so long, except for education, where the, like if anything, free market mania seems to be increasing in, you know, so that you have the you know, folks from these groups that we were talking about going state by state and making the case that we need to fund students, not systems. You know, well, what, like, what does that mean? How do you fund a student, not a system? And I think part of what you're talking about, Diane, with the problem of viewing public education through the lens of competition is, you know, it's related to another big problem we have. And that's this idea that it's a zero sum game, that my advantage can only come at your expense. And I think to me, what's so troubling about the idea of charter schools and the way that they've evolved is that they 
take that premise and bake it into the institutional level. Um, I read recently about a, a case of fraud in St. Louis where the head of a charter school exaggerated the number of students attending his school because it would be more money for him and thus, you know, less money, it would come at the expense of the city schools, right? And I thought, what a, what a bleak way to see the world, but also what a, like, what a sort of clarion example of how this mindset pits students and schools against one another. And, and that's where I find it hard to celebrate that vision. I think one of the factors at play here is the fact that uh, we have a national myth uh, that your education is what explains your outcomes in life, right? This myth of meritocracy. Um, we use our schools effectively as a privilege laundering machine in this country. We attribute uh, people's social and economic privilege that they have later in life to the fact that they went to a prestigious college or university. And how did they get there? Because they ostensibly went to the right high school and did well there. And you can follow it all the way down uh, to kindergarten. And so because of this, I think that, you know, many people believe that uh, the key to getting ahead is to be in the right school. And, you know, where are the people who have gotten ahead? They're in elite schools, right? They have often opted out of the public system and they attend this tiny fraction of schools that are non-denominational and right, not religious private schools, the so-called independent schools. Um, you will find uh, an outsized number of elites there. Now, are those better schools? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because those people are gonna do well wherever they go to school, right? And so I think one of the problems that we have is we're bad social scientists, most of us, and we think, well, it must be the school that explains that. Private schools must be better than public schools. And there are, of course, lots of other reasons why we might think that, um, right? We tend to, we know from, um, from uh, experiments that, People value things that they've chosen more than things that they've been given. Um, but we don't have time to get into that. The point is just that um, people think private schools are better than public schools, uh, despite the fact that there's a lot of research suggesting otherwise, including research by uh, the Lubinskys. Um, and I think that if we play this vision out and we think, okay, well, let's imagine every kid goes to a private school, right? Let's create that system. What have we done? We've got the same kids, probably the same teachers, because where are we going to get 3 million new teachers from to teach all these kids who are now in private schools? Possibly the same buildings, because we don't have the money to build all this infrastructure. Um, a lot of the same curriculum will be reused. All we've done is we've recreated the system, except without the transparency, without the oversight, without the regulation. So there are going to be massive opportunities for fraud, abuse, and discrimination. We'll also lose public governance. And this will be, and I think that this is intentional for those who are seeking to unmake public education, this will be the death blow to public life and collective agency, right? That this is how you finally get people to think of themselves as individuals in competition against one another in a free market. This is how you finally fracture everybody into an individualistic society. Um, and I, the final thing I'll add to this is consider the opportunity cost of that, right? The opportunity cost is what we don't do when we instead spend all of this time, effort, and energy on making the system. But what if instead of that, we spent all of those human and economic resources strengthening the system. What if we poured all of that energy and all of that money into improving the existing public education system, the values of which most Americans buy into? And I think the answer to that question is we'd all be a lot better off. Well, you know, one of the points uh, that I would make about private schools is that the elite private schools, uh, that lots of them are in Massachusetts and New England, uh, that people pay $50,000 a year for. Uh, they have 12 children out of class. They have spectacular physical facilities. I mean, who wouldn't want to be in a school like that? But then when you have a voucher program and you're given $4,500, you are not going to Phillips Exeter. You are not going to go to Andover. You're not going to go to uh, Miss Sudbury's uh, finishing school. They don't want you. They don't take vouchers. They don't care about these government programs. So what you will be in, where you will be instead is 
in a, a, a religious school with uncertified teachers, an uncertified principal, uh, perhaps teachers who aren't even college graduates. Uh, so these are not good schools. And that's why I question why do these very wealthy people, whether it's Betsy DeVos or Reed Hastings or Bill Gates, why do they continue to fund failure? Uh, and one of the questions on the message board was, why do people like Charles Koch, what, what, I, what does he think he's trying to gain by destroying public education? Does he really care about paying more taxes? I mean, the guy's worth 60 billion, 70 billion, I forget how many billions, but it's getting close to 100 billion. What would another billion in taxes really do to him? And why is this a passion of his? Why is it a passion of billionaires? And people think, oh, they wanna make money. I cannot be convinced that billionaires expect, expect to make a profit. They have some other motive in mind. What do you think it is? Well, I'm happy to answer the question about Charles Koch's vision because I recently read his new book. Um, here, I've got it right here. <laughs> It's called, <laughs> it's called Believe in People. And I, it's, he's, you know, he's kind of coming, he's presenting a new softer version of himself. It's called Bottom Up Solutions for a Top Down World. And I got it because I was very curious to see what is it that he has to say about education. Jack and I interviewed the author of a terrific book called Coke Land. Um, and uh, the author told us that education was really up at the very top of of the Koch network's priorities far more than people realize that, that we tend to think of them as focused on rolling back regulation in order to extract more things, right? But Koch has a very specific vision. When I mentioned the sort of industrialists who've been ma mad since the New Deal, I will put him in that camp. And all of these people believe very strongly that schools do not prepare kids to be ardently free market enough. And that if we could just move kids out of the public system into anything else, right? They're, they're interested in, in, uh, in homeschooling co-ops and anything that gets kids out of that public structure into private schools. I, I don't think they're, they have a particular passion about charters. Um, but really the goal is that you would free kids up from this public school monopoly and that there's almost something natural in them that would lead them to become what he calls social entrepreneurs. And I thought this is so interesting because it really like go back to the Reagan era and that's where you really hear people complaining about this from two camps. One is the rise of the moral majority where they see schools as godless and, and basically like uh, taking, um, uh, separating kids from their faith. And then you see the ardent free market people, and they think that that uh, that schools are basically turning kids socialists. And when they look around today, right, and you know the kids, if you look at the polls, the kids really are socialists. I think that explains part of their their frenzy. Um, it's you know like, do they want to pay less taxes? Absolutely, but their crusade is ideological and it's very pure. And I'll just add one thing to this, which is that, you know, for many of these billionaires, they're often billionaires, they often have oligarchic tendencies. Um, they think they're smarter than other people, right? Uh, if you think you're smarter than other people, it's very easy to look at the public education system and say, this thing is completely backwards, right? I can fix this. And the problem is, is, First of all, you're dealing with massive scale, right? You're talking about 50 million kids. Uh, you're talking about 100,000 schools here. You're dealing with constrained resources. You're dealing with a culture that is 150 years old. So in many cases, you know, why don't schools change? It's because parents don't want them to change. Um, schools are by nature a conservative institution. I don't mean that in the political sense, but right, we all go through school. And as a result, when we become caretakers of young people, we often want them to experience something like what we experienced. And in fact, look at teachers, right? Teachers are people who did well in school by and large and kind of enjoyed it. So they wanted to go back uh, and take on a different different role and help young people experience school uh, with the same kind of enjoyment and success that they did, right? There are all of these features of the public education system that make it very resistant to change. But at the same time, uh, it's been evolving very slowly over the past 150 years. And I don't need to say this to you, Diane, or to you, Jennifer. Jennifer, you've heard it from me a million times, and Diane knows it herself, that 
you know, people who make the argument that our schools haven't changed in the past 150 years, or they, you know, invent this story that they were modeled on factories and they've been sort of stuck in the amber ever since then, right? They don't know the first thing about what schools 150 years ago were like. They couldn't tell you about class size or the curriculum or whether or not teachers were trained. Um, our schools have changed dramatically. It's just they change incredibly slowly because of the size and because of, you know, so many other constraints there. And, you know, the final thing I'll say here is that, you know, many of these opponents of the existing public education system um, believe themselves to be, you know, data hounds, uh, you know, so they think they're really savvy when it comes to numbers and they fall for tricks, right? Like we can all remember Bill Gates, who is undoubtedly an extremely smart person, um, but who just doesn't know schools as well as other people do. Um, you know, people who teach in them, are, you know, maybe even people who attend them uh, and certainly not people who study them for a living um, because, you know, he bought Betsy DeVos's line uh, that, you know, improvement uh, has been flat, right? This, the scores have been flat and money has been shooting up. This is an old right wing trick, uh, you know, that completely fails to account for things like, you know, the value of today's dollars versus yesterday's or the fact that today's schools are serving special ed students who they once didn't serve. Um, they are more inclusive in terms of serving kids of color and low income kids, um, right? They're, they're uh, sort of playing games with NAEP scores. So I would say, you know, if, if oligarchs had a little more faith in people and a little more faith in educators, um, I think that they might have a different set of favored uh, reforms that they would be pushing. Well, you know, when I, when I wrote Reign of Error, my goal there was to knock down the, the myths and the first myth is our schools are failing. Yep. And so what I discovered was looking at NAEP scores over a very long period of time and looking at graduation rates, the graduation rates are the highest they've ever been in history. Uh, the test scores are the highest they've ever been in history for every group. Uh, and and you know, when you look at international comparisons, we are doing better than we did in the past. And we're in the middle, we're not at the top, but then we never were at the top. There's this myth that once upon a time we were number one in the world. Well, we were number one in the world in terms of access to education. We were never one in the world, number one in test scores and test scores are a reflection of uh, wealth and poverty. And because we have the greatest, uh, probably the largest percentage of kids in poverty, uh, we will always be in the middle and not at the top. And the only way we'll ever get to the top is by doing something serious about poverty. Uh, but I wanted to say something about uh, rural areas because I think this is uh, came up earlier. Uh, in Texas, uh, vouchers have been proposed every time the legislature's in session and every time it's been knocked down largely by a, a coalition of very strong pro-public school people, particularly led by the pastors for Texas children. And the pastors believe in separation of church and state and they working with other groups have created uh, a bond between rural Republicans and urban Democrats because rural Republicans know that their public school is the heart of their community. They don't wanna see a charter school come in and compete with their own local school that has 300 children. Why would they want a charter school? So this bipartisan coalition has defeated vouchers every time the legislature comes together and Texas is one of the few Republican states. Uh, uh, it may not be Republican much longer, but it, it is now. And it's one of the few Republican states where the vouchers have failed again and again because rural Republicans have said, no, thank you. Uh, I, I would also note that when New Hampshire had hearings about its sweeping universal voucher plan, uh, the outpouring of people was thousands and thousands of people came out to testify against it. Uh, they outnumbered the people for it, I think about five to one, six to one. So there is a disconnect between how people vote and how they value their public schools. They value their public schools. And I think it would be, your book will be extremely helpful in, in helping people see the big picture and putting all the pieces together, which I think is very difficult for people to do. Uh, I do want to add a question that came in from one of the viewers, and that is, uh, there are lots of debates, as we know, about the school reopening, and uh, it has largely been pitched as uh, science versus teachers unions. 
Uh, how do you reflect on that debate? I'm a little bit obsessed with this because it is, it's been just fascinating to watch it play out. Um, and then, you know, there's just been poll after poll, which reveals a breakdown of opinion that's almost entirely counter to what we hear about in the media. So for example, just yesterday, there was a poll that 80% of black parents wanna see teachers vaccinated before schools reopen. Why wouldn't they? Right, we're talking about a community that's been the hardest hit by COVID, and and that to, that seems like a very common sense demand. And yet, if you read in the like sort of the dominant narrative among opinion makers and elites, teachers demanding vaccines is you know is beyond the pale. Um, so I I think what's kind of I, I'm thinking about two things. Um, one is that the pile on against teachers unions is very much a bipartisan effort right now. But because the state houses are controlled by Republicans, as we've been discussing, the legislation that's going to come down against teachers unions is going to be focused uh, much more on things like suppressing the vote, right? That the Democrats and Republicans don't hold teachers unions in low regard for the same reason. For Democrats, it's that they think that unions get in the way of implementing common sense reforms, right? For Republicans, it's because unions are the loudest, most organized voice in favor of a social safety net and because they vote for Democrats. And so we're likely to see in state after state all kinds of very punitive measures directed at teachers unions as a result of the reopening furor. The other thing that I think is so interesting is that so much of the education reform movement and its policies have to do with the divide that has existed really since the 70s between communities of color and teachers unions, uh, that, that they've, they've often been at odds. And this during the pandemic, that has not been the case. I wonder if it's possible that we could see a realignment as a result of this, that the fact that teachers unions have been this loud voice for safety, I wish that they had been louder and it had been a call like a, for everyone's safety, right? That too often it sounds as though they just care about their own members. But if you're the loudest voice demanding safe schools and you're in a community that's been particularly hard hit, there's a lot of overlap there. And I view that as a positive thing. What say and, you, Jack? And I think that that's an extension of what teacher unions have been doing for the past, um, you know, we could say two years or five years, maybe a little bit longer, which is um, bargaining for the common good uh, that, you know, teachers have learned that uh, it isn't enough to simply say that when they're advocating for the things they need to do their jobs better, that that's good for kids, right? That that's not enough. They didn't win on that. I think that's true. Um, a lot of people didn't, weren't convinced by it. Uh, and so what they've done is they have very successfully gone out in state after state, right from California to West Virginia. And they've made the case that the things that they are demanding are things that actually are directly for kids and communities, even sometimes outside of school. Um, and that those are the things that they need in order to succeed at their jobs. And that's also right. And I, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So I want to wedge in something hopeful here, which is, I think that this pandemic has helped a lot of us remember what it is that a school does and what it is that a teacher does because we live in a country that tells pretty rotten stories about teachers and schools at least you know it has for the last few decades it didn't always um, you know ever since 1983 is a nation at risk report we've been telling stories about our failing schools it dates back you know at least to sputnik actually um, but it has intensified this rhetoric and it's divorced from reality the stories that we've told about our teachers have become increasingly negative and yet in this pandemic moment when so many of us have our kids at home sitting in front of a computer screen what do we what do we miss right we miss schools and all that they do for our kids. And I don't mean raising test scores in math and English, right? What my kid misses is the fact that, I'm gonna like really try not to cry here, um, is that her teachers know her, right? And, and she feels cared for by them. 
and she knows her classmates. And these are classmates who represent our city here. Um, and she has grown up with them, right? What she misses is that in her classroom, there are opportunities to play. Fewer than there ought to be because the standardized testing regime uh, you know, still rules. Uh, but she misses music in school. She misses art in school. She misses that 15 minutes of recess that they still get that hasn't been taken from them, right? These are the things that our children miss. And these are the things that we should be fighting for when our schools reopen, right? To give them pride of place, the pride of place that they once had in our schools and to fight for our teachers and the dignity of the teaching profession, because teachers are people who create these magical spaces that we call schools. They don't always live up to that magic, but they can. And the people who help, who make that possible are teachers. And that's up to the rest of us to make sure that they're able to do that. So I, I, I'm feeling hopeful that when schools reopen, we're, we're going to remember that, um, that a real school and a real teacher is better than a Zoom box and a laptop. I couldn't well, possibly top that. Maybe we better <laughs> just sign off. <laughs> you know, it's been my uh, theory. I was writing a new ending to my latest book. And uh, the, the pandemic had just started. And I said that the, what the pandemic will teach us is how much we need real teachers and that education is a human interaction. And parents, even in, after a month of the pandemic, were sick of being the teacher. And, and there were people saying, how does the teacher control 25 or 30 kids when I can't control my own two? Right. <laughs> and you know, there, there is, I think, a renewed appreciation for real school, uh, students will be eager to go back to school. They'll be happy to see their teachers. Uh, and I think that there will be a new, uh, some of the luster of remote learning is, is off because we've had it up to here and we really don't choose it. We may have to use it for a while longer, uh, but please not too much longer. Um, so I, I think that those are hopeful signs, but I think that this struggle that you've written about is going to go on. Uh, I had I don't know if there's time for one more question, but there was one question about one what impact did you think Arnie Duncan had on the support for school privatization? I think he had a huge impact. I went back and reread the very first speech recently that he he gave after uh, being sworn in as as Obama's um, Secretary of Education, and I was amazed how he just laid out their whole vision right there. Um, and, you know, how it's this very sort of instrumentalist vision that schools are the only policy uh, vehicle we have for overcoming poverty. And that, you know, like that, that it's a punitive vision as far as teachers were concerned and, you know, laying out the, the need for holding teachers accountable for their test scores. And, you know, he has this way of talking that I always think of as kind of fast folksy, you know, like making a bold claim and then throwing in a non sequitur after that. But it's amazing how much of the radical agenda we're watching play out right now across the state. There's always an Arne Duncan light version of it, right? And so when, when you hear Republican lawmakers saying, just give the money to the parents, right? That they're the best judges of, of their children's education. Arne Duncan would say something very similar about how, you know, the kind of school didn't matter. What mattered was that the parent chose it. What right. mattered was that, you know, uh, was that they, they had a, they, they were able to choose and that it was a school that, that produced results. And so I feel like in many ways, he was a, a warm up act in normalizing a certain kind of radical vision, but then by so insistently forcing a policy agenda that was so unpopular that, you know, that when, uh, I think one thing Betsy DeVos really understood was that parents don't, you know, like no one likes standardized tests. And so it, when she talks about a school and it's fit um, or, you know, like that makes, that resonates with people much more than than measuring school quality on the basis of math and English test scores. And so I think by, by both normalizing a radical vision and then insisting that we define schools in this very narrow, unappealing way that Duncan ended up doing a lot of damage. So if I can add one other thought, which brings us to the Biden administration, a friend of mine wrote a post today saying, uh, Biden should have focused 
completely on prioritizing vaccine for teachers instead of immediately introducing uh, everyone's going to take standardized tests. This is completely backwards. How did that happen? <laughs> You don't so know, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what? No, I, I think that Jennifer and I can, uh, between the two of us, answer that in about two minutes. And okay, uh, go for it. and and that's that. The the old neoliberal consensus um, is still top of mind for people like you know Joe Biden and his aides, um, right? That this consensus that carried from No Child Left Behind, George W. Bush, that actually was born prior to him with H.W. and Bill Clinton, um, carried forward across the Obama administration and then was disrupted by Betsy DeVos, who had this you know, radical vision of unmaking public schools. Um, and the Democratic Party has assumed that they can just go back to business as usual. Um, but the consensus is broken. The treaty has been broken. Um, and actually, that could be a good thing. It could be a good thing that Betsy DeVos made a hard right turn there because um, what it means is that we can't continue with this old neoliberal approach of you know, performance management via testing and accountability of moderated choice through charters, then instead the left is going to have to craft a, a powerful vision. And I think that that vision ought to be fully funding schools, promoting integration, and actually expanding the full vision of, uh, you know, what we want schools to do, um, which, you know, there's a long history of, and Diane, you've written about it, as have I, um, and it's about more than just test scores. Well, let me say, since we've reached the end of the hour, this has been lots of fun talking to you. Your book is very important. I hope everyone who's watching or listening in uh, buy, goes rushes out to buy a copy of A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. Uh, it pulls all the strings together and tells a narrative that is powerful, that is frightening, and that should be on everybody's bookshelf and in their hands. So thank you so much for talking tonight. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, and on behalf of Town Hall, I want to thank you all as well. Diane, thank you for your moderation. And um, Jack and Jennifer, thank you so much for presenting the uh, findings uh, that you have have come to in your research. Um, I really appreciate the historical perspective. Um, we, had a, we had an event last night that was um, about Black Lives Matter at school, and they offered a history as well. I think these two uh, events kind of paired together gives like a really full view of what we're dealing with, uh, with public schools. And I hope, um, you know, sort of energizes people to begin paying attention and, and doing something about it. Um, yeah, and as Diane said, uh, thank you everyone for watching. And if you're interested in purchasing a copy of A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, you can use the link uh, in the chat just below. That's gonna take you right over to Elliott Bay and you can help support them uh, in this time by purchasing through them. Um, so thank you all again so much. As Ware said, I hope that next time we can have you in person, but in the meantime- That would be great. Yeah, in the meantime, stay safe and I hope you have a great night. Thank Thanks everybody. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Good night. Bye.